At the inquest, we'll hear for the first time from people who were actually here that morning, from passengers on the train who saw the shooting, and from the two armed police who opened fire and killed Jean Charles de Menezes. The coroner for the inquest is a High Court judge, Sir Michael Wright. He has told the jury the hearings will be very delicate, very sensitive and very controversial. Surveillance officers monitoring Jean Charles's block of flats had followed him onto a bus. The jury will hear how that surveillance led to armed officers being deployed. They'll be asked to decide whether or not what happened next was an unlawful killing. Our inquiry into the London bombing, we wanted to investigate the suspicious death of Jean-Charles de Mendez. Within days of his brutal murder at the Stockwell tube station in the London Underground, evidence of a cover-up began to emerge. London police were later forced to admit that Mr. Dominez never ran from them, wasn't wearing a heavy coat, and that a special army unit had killed him execution style with over 10 shots to the head at point blank range. The British government was so desperate to keep the details of the shooting secret that they went so far as to arrest an ITN television journalist who had simply gotten a copy of what would normally be a public police report. Government whistleblowers and police have also been suspended and arrested for telling the truth. He ended up being shot in a London underground carriage full of passengers, but it's now being questioned whether the health and safety trial was in the public interest. A lot of police officers in that situation now are in added worry. I am facing a terrorist, not knowing for certain whether they're about to detonate a suicide bomb. I don't want them worrying. Am I going to be hauled in front of a, a court on health and safety charges? The police first claimed that it was a hot morning when official weather reports showed that it was around 60 degrees and that Mr. Dimenez was running down the street wearing a giant padded coat with wires sticking out of it, that he vaulted over the turnstiles, charged through a crowd of pedestrians, raced onto the train, and was about to detonate bombs when the heroic officers gunned him down. The authorities then conveniently claimed that all the surveillance cameras malfunctioned that morning. Police have now been forced to admit, thanks to watchdogs in their ranks, that none of the cameras malfunctioned, and they've now released the video. The government has now been forced to admit that he was wearing a light denim jacket, and there were no wires of any type. Police that weren't part of the special military unit didn't know why they killed him. The police had followed him from his home. They knew that he was a Latin Brazilian working in England as an electrician. They followed him for 30 minutes as he walked from his home towards the station. Once in the station, he calmly bought a Metro paper, paid for his ticket with his Metro Oyster card, and then walked onto the train. Passengers then reported that they were told to get off the train. Once they'd stepped off, Still looking through the windows, they saw the Special Forces police squat on Mr. Dominguez and shoot him over ten times in the head. Witnesses said Dominguez looked at the authorities as if he knew them. He was like a scared rabbit, and he was killed execution style. The question is why. A special military hit team stalked him and tracked him from his home to the train station and then killed him in cold blood, making sure he was dead. It's well known that if somebody has a bomb, you don't shoot at them. And you certainly don't get near them. No, Mr. Dominguez had seen something he wasn't supposed to see. He learned a little too much, and he had to be eliminated. Three years and two months to the day since he was shot, the London-based cousins of Jean Charles de Menezes arrived for the beginning of his inquest. His closest relatives, including his brother, remain in Brazil. They will come next month for part of the hearing, and they still have a burning desire for a justice they feel they've not yet had. Olha, a gente está muito frustrado até hoje. Because it's taken this long, he told us, it's been real torture. We can't wait for the end of the inquest. The policemen should be punished for what they did. We want to be finished with this anguish so we can have some peace. Jean Charles was shot dead in the head by armed officers on the London Underground. He was a young Brazilian electrician on his way to work. We were at the station just a week after he was killed, and many of the facts we've covered were already public knowledge. But still, some of the locals made excuses for the police. He is a man under intense pressure. His force found guilty yesterday on health and safety charges after armed officers shot a commuter dead on the tube. 
The Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Sir Ian Blair, needs every friend he has at the moment. This morning, after some terrible headlines for him, the Home Secretary rode to his rescue. I have confidence in Sir Ian and the Metropolitan Police, who day in, day out, are facing the challenge of keeping British people safe from terrorism, and where, of course, the Metropolitan Police, under Sir Ian's leadership, have also managed to bring down crime in London. It all arose out of the killing of the innocent Brazilian electrician, Jean Charles de Menezes. Within hours of the 7-7 bombings, Israeli army radio was reporting that Benjamin Netanyahu, the former prime minister of Israel, had been warned not to leave his hotel that morning to attend a meeting less than 100 yards away from one of the train stations that was bombed. The Associated Press ran the headline, Netanyahu changed plans due to warning. Then the current prime minister, Ariel Sharon's office, instructed Israeli officials not to give interviews to the foreign media concerning the warning. Israel's foreign office attempted to spin the story, saying that they'd given a general warning to the British that day. Then several weeks later, the head of Mossad told a major German newspaper that he indeed had issued a warning to Benjamin Netanyahu at 8.40 a.m., 10 minutes before the first blast. Conveniently for authorities, the bus surveillance camera malfunctioned. Something else happened that was convenient for the establishment line. All four of the supposed bombers' identification cards survived unscathed at all four events. But there was just one problem. In one case, one of the bombers' IDs was found at two separate locations. As the evidence mounts, it is crystal clear. Only criminal elements of the British government could stage the attacks and then engage in the cover-up. The reason the Netanyahu story is important is it clearly shows that other intelligence agencies were aware of what was going on in London that day and took necessary precautions to protect their Minister of Finance. In 1994, the Israeli embassy in London uh, was bombed. This was at a time when I was in the service. I joined the Middle Eastern section shortly after that. And I was actually astounded um, to read a document written by a senior MI5 officer who'd seen all the information coming in about this attack. And he said that he believed that the Israelis had bombed their own embassy. In any stage terror attack, governments have to be extremely careful to keep the operation shielded, compartmentalized. Most people in government are moral individuals who believe that they're standing up for their nation's sovereignty, for its national interest, and it's absolutely essential to keep them in the dark. One of the chief tools used by governments as a smokescreen is staging exercises or drills at the exact same time and exact same places as real events. When the Oklahoma City Federal Building was bombed, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms was staging an anti-terror drill with their bomb squad on the morning of April 19, 1995, at the same time that the real event took place. On the morning of September 11, 2001, the Pentagon was running five separate drills. Two of the drills targeting the exact same targets at the exact same time. That caused NORAD to stand down, believing it was just a drill. And London was no different. It's important to note that those taking part in the drills need not know that they're part of a larger operation. In fact, it's better for the conspirators that they not be informed. One of the chief reasons this is done is so that if any of the operatives carrying out the attack are caught by other elements of the government, they can simply claim that they were taking part in a drill or an exercise. NSA, InfoPol 9, and Echelon-type systems that are scanning for terrorist chatter will be fooled into believing they've simply picked up part of an exercise. On the morning of 7-7 in London, there was a simultaneous exercise targeting the exact same trains, the exact same bus, at the exact same location. 